Some reactions require us to cool our flask or container as we're performing the reaction or before we're performing, before a certain step. And for that, we utilize different cooling, cooling baths to do that. Um, there's some interesting and some important things to take note of before uh, we begin to cool our apparatus. So I've got this mock apparatus with our nice red solution here. Um, and one of the important things to do, especially with cooling, is to initiate a positive gas pressure. So we can imagine that as this cools down, the entire system will contract, which will um, kind of create a negative pressure pushing in, uh, or a, a, a negative pressure inside the reaction, so air will want to push into our um, reaction. Um, this is especially important if we're doing things with um, air sensitive compounds, as things that are sensitive and require low temperatures might also be air sensitive. So to get around that or to, to help um, reduce that problem, we can start with a nitrogen flow into our system so that we have sort of a positive out pressure. So I've started the nitrogen and we can see here on our bubbler, the, the bubbles moving through, it's a pretty good rate. And that should help prevent um, any air from getting into our system as it cools down. It's also worth noting that once you've lowered your bath to allow your apparatus to um, warm back up, that you should also make sure that your bubbler is still on um, or on, turned back on after the reaction, your reaction is over if it's been off for that reason. Um, so that as your apparatus warms up, you don't have um, joints come apart as the gases inside expand, they might push on your joints. So that way you have a, a relief valve for any um, changes in the gas pressure within your apparatus. So. Um, and that's another reason why rubber bands are also important to uh, prevent glassware pieces from flying away if you uh, forget something like that or if pressure gets too high for even your bubbler to manage. One of the most basic ways that we can cool a reaction is using an ice bath. Now this is just water right now, but I've got some ice here in the bucket. So I'm just gonna add some ice here. And it's important to make sure that you have enough ice and water that it will be above the level of your solvent. And also that you don't have so much that you'll overflow your, um, your bath capacity. Also having a bath that's appropriately sized to your flask. So this one might be a tad oversized for this small of a flask, but it should still work well. Um, uh, making an ice bath, you often use more water than actual ice. I liken it to making cereal usually, so, um, and it can be done in any order. So, and then one key thing is to, kind of before you start, is to make sure that you have your um, stir plate and things on a, um, a lab jack so that you can raise your, raise and lower your bath to your um, apparatus instead of the other way around. It just makes things easier. Um, it's just easier to do that, do things that way. And there we go. We've got our bath raised to where the liquid level is level with our red solution. So here we can see that my bath's actually not too full. I'm quite close to the top, but I think I could cover the level of any solution I was trying to chill in this bath quite easily um, without overflowing my bath. Um, uh, one thing you'll want to have nearby is a, um, a beaker or sometimes a syringe with a little short piece of tubing on the end. I don't have one at hand. Is a, a great way to remove a little bit of extra water and then be able to add more ice as it melts. So uh, I'm gonna get a thermometer and you can look at how cold this bath will get um, here in a few minutes. It's also worth discussing thermometers, um, especially kind of picking the right thermometer for your bath. So this large thermometer with the blue liquid in it, um, it has a maximum degrees uh, or a maximum measurement of 260 degrees Celsius and the net minimum of minus 10. That's its kind of its range. So it has a really good range, more so kind of on the high end. Um, this would probably work for this bath. I don't see it getting much below minus 10 or ever below minus 10. But 
for polar bats, this of course would not be good. Um, this one goes to minus 20, so. Um, we don't use um, thermometers to stir bats ever. Doesn't matter what kind of bath. They're just for measuring temperature. We don't want to break them and cause problems with our reaction. So we can position our thermometer in the bath here. And the response on these alcohol thermometers is pretty quick. Um, I already see it dropping. I expect that will get to about zero or maybe a little bit below. Anyway, um, thermometers can have these little rubber things on them which make them are useful for uh, suspending them in clamps. Another way to do that is to take a short piece of tubing and cut it off and then cut it down lengthwise and then you can wrap it around the thermometer and then use it to have a larger diameter for a clamp to grip to and it will then grip also on the thermometer. So they're just in that few seconds that went from room temperature to just below zero. So the alcohol thermometers have a pretty good response time. Okay, we'll move on to other things. A common cooling bath seen in organic chemistry is a dry ice and acetone bath. So that can be made um, by, of course, just making, putting dry ice, uh, putting acid, dry ice in a bath of acetone, and that will get you about minus 77 or 78 uh, Celsius. So to do that, you need to do it in um, a doer. So this is a, a wide mouth doer. Um, they come in different sizes. This will be one, of course, for a much smaller reaction flask. Um, so to kind of demonstrate that, we would first fill our doer with acetone. Um, about to the level where we expect our flask to sit. So I've got it filled. It's a mirror-y interior there, so I've got it filled to about, and there's maybe an inch, I think maybe I could use a little more. Um, yeah. It's kind of difficult to tell sometimes how much is in there. Get the camera a little bit closer. Yes, you can see the surface of the acetone is right there. Anyway. And then to that, we would add dry ice. Now dry ice can come in different forms. Sometimes you'll have pellets, sometimes you'll have large blocks. This was a block that I broke up with a hammer. Um, you want to be careful with dry ice. You don't want to touch it with gloved hands for any really any amount of time um, unless you have leather gloves or, or a cryo glove like this one. Um, the better options are to use something like these kinds of tongs, which is what I'm going to use. See if we can get our box of dry ice over there. And then we want to add dry ice to the acetone so that we don't end up with it kind of boiling over. So, because as we add that, that was a pretty big chunk to add, so we are getting some boil over anyway. <laughs> Again, as we've discussed about thermometers, it's important to have the correct kind of thermometer. This one has a negative 100, so it's a good place to start. So let's go ahead and put that thermometer in our acetone. And we can see, I hope you can see that, our temperature is already plummeting. We're, we were, of course, at room temperature about 22 degrees, and it's now dropping to 15, and we'll probably continue to drop. So let's add a smaller chunk of dry ice. All right. I'll keep adding dry ice and bring it back when it's to temperature. 
So you can watch the thermometer there as I continue to add the dry ice. It's already at minus five. So I had near two pounds of dry ice, and so depending on how long you need it to keep it at a certain temperature, you can kind of guess it from there, but um, just to get your bath started, you'll probably use almost the entire two pounds for a bath of this size. Um, this is probably 200 to 300 milliliters of acetone. to say um, this is a like a six inch uh, doer it's about three inches deep um, so to maintain your temperature you'll probably have to add dry ice every probably 15 minutes you've gotten it to temperature. That would be maybe not a lot every 15 minutes, a small piece to maintain your temperature. But the biggest use is going to be at the beginning, just getting it cold, getting it down to a useful temperature.
There are many other types of cooling bath we can do that use a, a solvent and something to cool it with. Liquid nitrogen is another common way. Um, a liquid nitrogen combination with another solvent is a really common uh, method. One of them that gets really close to dry ice and acetone is liquid nitrogen and ethyl acetate. So if you can't get dry ice for whatever reason, that's a good alternative. I think there's only a few degrees difference between the two. But that means we have to highlight how to get liquid nitrogen. So this is our uh, nitrogen tank. Um, it's called a doer or a lock set. Um, and then we're gonna use that small handheld doer on the floor. We're gonna get some liquid nitrogen into that and then have that on hand to do our, um, to make our cold bath with. So, but we need some PPE when dealing with liquid nitrogen. So we have these cryo gloves. Um, they're just gloves that will help protect your hands from the liquid nitrogen from the cold. So go ahead and put those on. And then this face shield just to protect us also from splashes and um, just extra protection. Of course, you'll be wearing goggles or um, safety glasses as well. Goggles are a better idea. I think required for this lab too. One of our first step is to take our, our uh, handheld doer here and we will put our rubber hose in it. Pretty straightforward. Um, and if a little cap, I'll just throw it off. The then, here on the top of the canister, there's this valve for the liquid. We just want to open it slightly. But with our other hand, we want to be holding onto this tube because when it the gas starts coming out, it might make this tube go flying out and go all over the place. So at first, we'll hear the gas taking out. The tube's going to kind of stick. So that means it's cooling down. We've got to get it to a kind of nice So at first we're just going to be cooling down the inside of the doer since it's basically room temperature. That liquid nitrogen is quite a bit colder than that. It's got to cool down that interior of that doer before it can condense and stay liquid in there. So it should be getting pretty close. That vapor's kind of chilly on the arm coming here right now. And we should be filling now. Let's get down here closer. Sounds more like liquid instead of gas rushing around. Yep, we're getting some splashes at the top. Also, you can see here, the gas is cold coming out through that thing that will shrink the joint and then leak out. So it's really hard to seal those joints with the liquid nitrogen since they shrink so much. So, and then we just go for a little while. This takes a little bit, probably five to ten minutes to fill up. Depending on how much you need. You don't have to fill it full, of course. Yeah. We'll bring it back in when we're ready for the next part. We're going to make our ethyl acetate and our tank grass. To uh, get to stop this, of course, we just shut off our liquid nitrogen there at the top. And then the hose is going to be stiff, so kind of work your way out of it if you can. And if you can't, you'll have to wait until the hose is flexible again, then it warms up, and then you can uh, remove it. And cap your doer and you good to go. So I've got our nitrogen here. So now we're ready to make our bath of ethyl acetate and liquid nitrogen. So we've got our ethyl acetate, our 
small uh, dish doer here. We'll go ahead and fill it up about halfway with the ethyl acetate. So just like with any bath, we want to raise our bath to what we're um, cooling in this case. I'm going to raise up this doer a little bit, and then I'm actually going to lower the thermometer now. So we'll touch the bottom and then just back off a little bit. And I've got some nitrogen doer. Start by just pouring out some of this cold vapor, I guess. And our temperature is dropping. <clears throat> We're actually up around 30 degrees, so I do believe that this thermometer does have a bit of an offset. Um, it's not 30 degrees in here. some problems with this thermometer. It just plummeted, but still gives us an idea of where we are. reiterating that the goal of one of these baths isn't to completely solidify the um, solvent you're using. You're trying to generate frozen solvent in, a li in the liquid solvent, kind of this slush we've got here, so that, and the nitrogen is just a way to cool down that solvent to its freezing point. 
so that we can generate this slush. There we go. Now that this is starting to thaw a bit, we can break it up. starting solvent a little bit more than you think you need. It seems that generally they shrink when they freeze, unlike water, uh, at least for organic solvents that, will be, that you would use for this kind of a thing. 